Nikki, thank you so much for coming on RealPod. I am just so excited to talk to you today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you. Has this whole thing been a whirlwind? Is it just crazy, <laughs> like your life before the show being on Netflix and now? Unbelievably so, yes. We, we really did the show kind of just on a whim, like an adventure. I sent in his picture and his bio. I saw the casting call on Instagram, and I thought, oh, well, that would be kind of cool. Let's just see what happens. I never really gave it a second thought. And then he got chosen. Never in a million years did we expect his presence and his personality and just his whole essence to be received the way that it has been. It's just been, it's been mind blowing. He's just being himself. You know, this is really <laughs> who he is. And it's, it's been so heartwarming. It's been great. I was laughing so hard at the TikTok. That was the woman saying, this is my cousin TT and like, I will yes. die for him. And then when I saw that you do edit it, I was laughing okay. so hard. She's like the coolest. We love her. I mean, we've been messaging back and forth. Oh. I mean, the people that we've just, you know, met just through the virtual world. It's unbelievable. It's been really oh, great. I'm so yeah. happy for you all. And yes. when you were going to start filming the show, so did Tanner, was he excited? Like, had he talked about wanting to find a partner and like date? Or did you think it would be a nice new experience was, for him? Honestly, it was more, it was really just more like a, just the adventure aspect of it. I feel like for Tanner, you know, when you grow up with a difference, I feel like the whole first basically 10 years of his life from time of diagnosis, which was around four into his early teens was just doctor's appointments and therapy and searching for answers and not doing what everybody else his age was doing and not kind of being included and having a lot of the normal experiences. And then things picked up a lot in high school. And then of course, when he went to Clemson, as we've, you know, put a lot on his social media about his life kind of exploded. And so since he has gained such a much bigger skill set and has so much more ability to be social and to be out in the world, we were like, let's just do everything we possibly can. And he really had not dated much. He's been to a few dances, done things in groups, but hadn't really dated. And we were like, well, what a cool way to just experiment and see what happens and also meet a bunch of people. It's a challenge. He'll mature. You know, we were like, this is just a great way to challenge him and just have a cool new experience in the meantime. But honestly, we didn't think about it a whole lot more deeply than that. It was, And he was excited because he's so outgoing. And he was just excited to meet new people. He was like, sure, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> and like you said about him, you know, maybe not having the same experiences and some of those struggles, I was drawn to you. Um, and I know you were on the show for just a little bit, but when you were talking about, um, you know, how the first, you know, it sounded like 10 years of his life, it was hard. And there was some was. like resistance to accepting kind of what this was. was. And I thought that that was really real and candid. And I'm sure Thank moms you. in this position, they don't know, they don't know what the road ahead um, has in store. So that's why I was really looking forward to, you know, asking you about even just finding out, you know, when he was diagnosed. I'm so glad you brought that up because honestly, that has been one of the main things that I hoped would come of this. If a mom who is in the stages that I was, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, can look at Tanner's life and where he is now and hear about what we have come through, because what people are seeing now is the result of 20 years of really, really hard work, a lot of prayer, a lot of hard years. We were not having this much fun 10 years ago. We were not having this much fun 15 years ago. It was a long, long road. And if his life can inspire those moms who are kind of in the trenches now and trying to figure out which therapy road is the best for their child, which school setting is the most conducive to their child's learning, if, if he can be a beacon of light for them to hang on and keep going, because it is possible to achieve independence. And it is, there are university programs out there for different learners. There are collegiate experiences. There are places willing to employ people who are differently abled, like where Tanner works at The Shepherd. That's really the message we want him to send. And what we were hoping that on the show that they would, you know, just a little bit talk about The Shepherd or the fact that he does live on his own. He does not live in my house here with me. He lives almost three hours away. Way. And then they, they actually showcased it a lot, which we were absolutely thrilled about because that is one thing that people have really, really responded to and just been super intrigued with. You know, a lot of people are like, I had no idea there were programs like that. I had no idea there were places that would hire people who are not necessarily, you know, the norm walking around typical person. And so for 
people to realize, and then it gives them hope and it gives them motivation. I mean, what more could you ask for than yeah. something like this? It's it really special to amazing. watch. Mm-hmm. It, that's been the most heartwarming part to me. And the, I haven't counted and I should have the amount of messages that I have gotten from other moms in my dams is just, I've sat and cried. I don't know how many nights I'm like, I mean, just, I read these messages and I can feel how those moms feel. You know, they're like, my little boy is two. We just got diagnosed or my four-year-old has been in OT for two years and we're waiting on the final diagnosis. I know exactly how that mom feels. And I remember that fear and that frustration and the loss and just that feeling of you don't know where to go. You don't know who to trust. You don't know what's the best route to take, but you have to do it. You're the mom. You have to do it. And that was just such a tough season. And if our family and Tanner's life can support those people that are facing it now and help them and give them hope, all we could ever ask for. You guys are incredible. I mean, seriously. And I had to know, like, Tanner is so special in his disposition yeah. as it just radiates through the internet and through the TV. And so you have to know that's that's a person who comes from great siblings and great parents. And well, I you. mean, I'm ex- that's why I'm just excited to hear about everything. What were some of his early signs that led you to realize mm-hmm. he's different than my other kids? Yeah. Tanner is the second of four. He has an older sister and then he has a younger sister and a younger brother. When he was about two and a half, I started noticing that he, he, Tanner never stopped talking, which is usually like a hallmark sign, either like language never develops or it will stop developing or they will lose language. We were very blessed in that he never did, but his conversational skills and like his understanding of, you know, intended meaning and things like that slowed down. And I started noticing that he appeared very blank and his play habits became unusual. Like instead of taking little tractors and trucks and rolling them and pretending that they were doing their work, he would line them up in a row. And then he would move the back one to the front and the front one to the back and just stare at it. He started getting extremely, um, just absolutely, he had to wear the same shirt. He had two shirts and that's all he was going to wear. So I would wash one one day and then we'd wear the other one the next day. You know, we rotated those two shirts. And normally I would have been like, you're going to wear the shirt that I put on you. You know, you're a little, you know, three-year-old child, but I could tell that it was like hurting his soul to wear a different shirt. He, he would just act, you know, just terrified to wear a different shirt. Play group, his play habits were different. All the kids would go to the swings. He would go to the slide. They come to the slide. He'd go to the swings. He just started na- isolating himself on his own from other children What was tricky about Tanner, and I think it is for, you know, a lot of kids who remain verbal, he could always talk. He, and he was very warm and affectionate with my husband, myself and his siblings at that time, there's, there was only one and one on the way, but, and, you know, grandparents, cousins, he was very warm and affectionate. He didn't push away from any of us. He didn't isolate from us. And so I would take him to the pediatrician and he would answer her questions. And I would, you know, bring up these concerns. I'd say, I really think some things he's doing are a little odd. He's not really interacting with other children. He's not making great eye contact with his teachers. They tell me that he doesn't really listen. He just sits with his head down or goes off in a corner. And, you know, I got a lot of, um, you know, oh, he's just a boy. Your your daughter's very precocious. Don't compare him to her. He's going to develop at a different rate. All very well-intentioned, but he presented pretty normally, like in an exam, and it finally, this, and remember, this is back at like 2001, 2002. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have a camera, you know, on our phone and videoing every five seconds of our day, you know. And I finally got the idea, I need to video some of what he's doing. So I get my camcorder, you know, back <laughs> in the day. And I started taking videos of him, of just some of the oddities. And he started also having a lot of what they call it stimming, like self-stimulatory behavior. He started doing a lot of really unusual hand posturing And he had a lot of little ticks and jerks in his head. It was sort of like he had overactive peripheral vision. And I started videoing that. And I took that to my doctor. And that was when I got the, okay, whoa, I see what you're saying now. This does not look like something we want to see. So that's when we got serious. He was between two and a half and three. And we started going for evaluations. And we went, we started with occupational therapy and speech therapy. Before we ever got the autism diagnosis, we started working. Both those practitioners were looking at me saying, I know it isn't said yet, but I think this is autism. And the only autism I had ever seen or been exposed to like in 2001 was the movie Rain Man. 
with Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise. That was all I knew. And I'm looking at my precious, sweet, darling little boy. And I'm thinking, what? I'm, I'm, I was like, no, no way. I was like, I was 26 years old when I had him, healthy as a horse, had a great pregnancy, good delivery, breastfed him. I thought, there's no way. I mean, there's just, there's no way this can be true. Well, after about 18 months of an exhaustive diagnostic process, a lot of appointments, he was diagnosed with high functioning autism. And then we found out over the years that he also had a lot of sensory integration dysfunction. Tanner has auditory processing disorder and nonverbal learning disorder. So he's got um, multiple diagnoses going on in addition to his autism. Um, so yeah, it was a long, long road. And I just remember the day that they actually gave me the piece of paper that said, yes, we're, he's autistic. This is what we're calling it. I remember this feeling of just like stillness and just thinking, oh my God, this just happened. This actually happened. Like they're telling me this perfect little boy, there's nothing on him that I can look at and say, okay, I see something that his brain works differently. And this is not the child and the life that I thought we were going to have and he was going to have. But at the same time, it's just kind of this, like, I felt just like, I need to lay on my back on my bed and stare at the ceiling for a week. And I need somebody to take care of me and, and accept this and get some energy, you know, to, to figure out what to do. At the same time that you're feeling that, you're feeling this incredible sense of urgency. I didn't know anybody with a child with autism. And I felt this sense of just like, you're his mother. You have to figure it out. You have to help him. You have to help him. Nobody's going to help him if you don't help him. And it was the strangest paradox to live in you know, this feeling of paralysis, of sadness and fear and just not wanting to accept it. And at the same time, like, and everyone in my ear was saying early intervention, early intervention, early intervention, get on it while he's little. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I have to start therapies right now. I have to do everything I possibly can for him and the quicker, the better, but you don't know what to do. So there started the therapy search journey. And that's when you just put your heels in the ground and you start talking to people and making phone calls at that time and traveling. If, if it was out there and somebody told me that they'd had good results and I thought that it was a plausible thing, we did it. We did everything. <laughs> you talk a lot about then learning to accept how he is. But I could imagine that when he's young, you're thinking, if I just sit back and accept, I'm not doing my job as a mom because Absolutely. I'm letting this continue when maybe there's a chance, like you said, early intervention, I could change this. I really believed, I was like, okay, if I just work hard enough, if I push hard enough, like, and I'll start to cry, you know, like, if I love him enough, you know, I can fix this. And that's what I meant when I said on the show, I never meant that I would, you know, wanted him to be a different person. What I meant was that I can take this hard road away from my precious little boy, you know, that I, I can make life easier because as mothers, you want your child to have the easiest path possible. You want their success. You want them, you know, to thrive in life and to have everything work out for them, you know, and, and of course you're doing everything possible to give them every opportunity. You're providing the best education, the best home, the best nutrition, the best, you know, hobbies and activities. And in my mind, I think I really, really, really felt this unbelievably immense pressure to, to, to fix it and make it where he would not have to walk down this, what I perceived as much harder path. And to be quite honest, and this is just my honest opinion, it is a harder path. I have three typical children. It's easier. You know, some people might not like me to say that, but it's easier raising a typical, I've done three out of four typical children. It's an easier road. You know, having a child with a difference is a whole different ball game on every level, emotionally, mentally, financially. Um, the stress on your marriage is unbelievably bigger. It stresses you and your partner as individuals. It stresses you as a couple. You're constantly feeling, I know I have three other children and this is constantly feeling the pull between feeling like you have to give everything to this one that, but yet you just want to celebrate your typical children too and give them their fair share and never make them feel slighted because you're caring for the extra needs that that special child has. So it really is a balancing act. And it's a lot about realizing your limitations and realizing that God gave you that child for a reason. 
And he gave you to that child for a reason and that you were matched up and there's, and, and it was all what was meant to be for the story of your family. Cause I can definitely say, and I did not expect to get a little emotional in this. Um, my other three children are completely different humans than I think who they would have been if they didn't have Tanner. I mean, both of my girls, who I'm, I'm, they've been a lot on his social media. They have just been his champions. I mean, they have, my older daughter is like another mother to him. She has blazed the trail for him. She taught him a lot. She led him. My younger daughter has been with him more in the past few years because they've been at Clemson together. So she's been more of like his, you know, day-to-day -day contact sister. I mean, loves him, adores him. They have the most fun, spontaneous friendship. She's a great listening ear. She can ground him. Tanner does struggle with anxiety. She's a real grounding force for him. And then for my younger son, you know, he's had quite a different experience. His only brother, who is seven years older than him, is not a typically developed young man. So we've always said to Maverick, that's our younger son, it's kind of like you're the older brother. So you're getting a whole different take on life because developmentally, you do know some things that Tanner doesn't and you're driving and doing some things that Tanner doesn't, even though you're seven years younger. So it's a really neat dynamic to watch like the the younger brother sort of care for the older and, and lead him and guide him through life and the way they've impacted each other. And other special needs parents will get it. It changes their siblings in ways that you just can't imagine. And when it first happens, you feel like, oh, you know, are they going to resent their sibling that has special needs? Are they going to resent us because we had to take care of their sibling? But as they become young adults, every one of them would say they wouldn't trade a minute. You know, as hard as it was at times, you know, what it has done for their life and their heart and the way they see the world, it's you you can't, I mean, you can't manufacture that. I've loved seeing his relationship with his sisters, especially as you mentioned, because they're on yeah. Instagram, because after like as just a viewer, you know, you watch the show and you're like, this man needs to be protected at all costs. You want to go <laughs> investigate like who are his friends? Who are his people? Is he being yes. loved and cherished? And then, you know, to go find you all on social yeah. media and see it's just exactly that. It's just he is it's a lucky so guy heartwarming. He has a lot of people that love him, <laughs> which um, is probably why he's so loving back because yeah. he definitely has a lot of people in his corner. Not surprised. Um, you mentioned Nikki a few times about like just some of the years being really difficult. Can you give an example of like a moment that was really tough? I can. <laughs> There's one that has always stuck out to me. We started interventions and therapies at two and a half to three. We actually got diagnosed at four. And when we did that, we pulled him out of typical schooling and we started an in-home ABA program, which is applied behavioral analysis. Everything has changed so much. Like what's considered the best is now very different. But the main crux, kind of the backbone of his therapy was ABA. And we had a team of four girls in this house, in our guest room. We turned it into a school room about 35 hours a week. And they worked with him pretty much full time. And I mean, ABA starts from look at me. I mean, that's what it starts with. Look at me. And they started from there and built his social skills from eye contact it was, it was wild. And then we would take him to OT. We were doing nutritional therapy. We were doing chiropractic supplementation. There was just so many things we were doing. And it was my whole life. You know, that was all I was doing was managing the therapy program for this child. So that went on for several years. My entire life was consumed pretty much with autism. I mean, I was always thinking about his schooling, his next therapy appointment, what we were going to do. And I'll be honest, I mean, this is the real part. I might as well be real. I was doing everything that I was supposed to do and, and, and willingly wanting to. I wanted to give him more. I would have given him more if I could have, if there was two of me, you know, I would have. But in my heart, there was always, always that feeling of why did this happen? You know, what did we do wrong? Why did this happen to him? You know, I want him to be out there playing baseball. I want him to go to the school where my other children go and his cousins go. And this is so hard and this is all of my time and I'm exhausted and I'm frustrated and it's so expensive. And all those things were happening in my heart. I was smiling on the outside and I was taking him everywhere I needed to go. And I was, you know, looking for the next thing all the time and always, you know, trying to support him. But in my heart, I was not in a good place. And I remember we took him for some testing. It was just, it was just like basically an updated psychological evaluation that schools need every so often. And I'll never forget, I was driving home from Columbia, South Carolina, which is about 45 minutes away and did have cell phones by that time. And this was in his school years. 
And the psychologist called me with the results of the test and it included an IQ test and basically just kind of where he was developmentally. And this is after, you know, just giving our entire life to his therapy and his schooling and just pushing, pushing, pushing for more all the time and trying to help him be his best. And the psychologist said, well, hey, Miss Smith, I just want to give you the results of the test. Is now a good time? And I was like, sure, I'm driving. Go ahead. You know, go ahead. Tell me what you what you found. And the results were horrible. I mean, they were so dismal. I mean, it, it was everything that I wanted to be high was low. Everything I didn't want him to say, he said. And I can remember driving, it was pouring rain and just sobbing. I mean, I remember like, you know, the kind of crying where you're just snotting down your face. Mm -hmm. And I no. was crying <laughs> and driving. And the psychologist, the poor man, he was so nice. He was like, Miss Smith, do you need to pull over? I'm a little concerned that you're crying this hard and you're driving and I hear that it's raining. And I was like, in my mind, I was like, I'm fine, but my kid is not. And I have worked so hard for all these years and he's still not okay. He's still not okay. And we've done all this work and spent all this money and you're giving me these test results. And I can't, I, I just remember thinking, I, I don't know what else to do. I, I, I don't know who else can I hire? What else can I do? And that was the point where one of my dear, dear friends said to me, she said, Nikki, she said, maybe God is just really working on you. And she said, you know, what, how would you feel if someone told you he's never going to be any different than he is today? His functioning level will never go up. He will always have the same level of need. He will always have the same, need the same level of assistance. Can you just be okay with that? Can you just take it as it is and just say, this is the boy God gave you and be good. And I remember thinking my automatic gut reaction was, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I'm okay with that. I really don't know if I can just accept that. And it was so hard. But then I started, you know, I, I prayed about it and I thought, you know, I don't have a choice. You know, if that's what's to be, this is my precious, precious son. And if this is all so sorry that it's going to be then now I have to love him right where he is and I have to find joy in him and he does not need to look at my face every day and see stress and see worry and see anxiety because that's feeding into him so I made a commitment right then I said okay I'm going to pray about this I'm going to say okay God you gave him to me to shepherd to raise to give opportunities to to guide but you didn't give him to me to make him who he is. He's yours. So you're in charge now. I'm going to give him the opportunities. I'm going to love him. I'm still going to push him. We're still going to try everything we know to do. But if this is where we are, then this is just where we are. And it's going to have to be okay. And it was, I am not kidding. And I'm, I'm not making it up. From that day forward, it was like her trajectory just went up. I made a tremendous effort from that time on to make sure that every time I talked to Tanner, that I smiled at him more, that I was calmer around him, that I didn't, you know, if, if he didn't know how to do something or understand something or we're on the way to the, you know, 45th OT appointment for that month or whatever it was, that I just went with it and that I was just more okay with things and that I spent more time just playing with him just loving him and just, you know, being good with whatever it was, everything changed. I mean, everything changed. And he, he became more joyful. He became more relaxed. He, and, and, you know, maybe some of it was coincidental with just where he was in development too. You know, I mean, maybe it was just coming through the, as we were moving into those adolescent years and then moving through puberty, it was going to happen, but it was pretty cool how that timing, you know, and when that mental shift in me just brought about such a change in him. And when I changed, you know, internally myself, it trickles out to the other children, to the marriage. You know, if you take that stress level down a few notches and just say, you know what, let's look for the good. Let's look for the good in everything about this. Let's be thankful for the, for the people that we're meeting that we wouldn't have known if he wasn't autistic. Let's be thankful instead of internally boiling about what's not happening. Let's be thankful for these amazing teachers and these amazing therapists and all these people who love him in his life. And, you know, those, those internal changes really started to manifest on the outside. And from then on, 
it, it, I mean, there's certainly, it's always a little bit five steps forward, three steps back with autism. I mean, it is, but it was a whole lot more forward than back from that time on. So yeah, I'll never forget that phone call. And if you would have told me, and this is really what I want like other younger moms to hear. If you would have told me on that day, he's going to go to Clemson. He's going to graduate. He's going to walk across the stage at Clemson and get a diploma from President Clements. I would have laughed in your face. And then, oh, and by the way, he's also going to live independently with roommates on his own, you know, almost three hours away. He's not coming home after Clemson. He's not going to return home. He's going to live up there with roommates and have a job at a beautiful hotel with people that love him. I would have been like, no, that's absolutely not possible. And then, you know, oh, and after that, then he's going to jump on a Netflix show <laughs> and have friends all over the world. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just like, it, it is truly just amazing. It's 20 years, you know, it's 20 years later after all that it's 20 years. And it was, it was a lot of years where we just put one foot in front of the other. And, and it, it takes those years to get to what people are seeing now, you know? Yeah. And honestly, like what you just so beautifully shared, I think is one of the biggest, hardest lessons to learn in life, which is mm -hmm. acceptance. Oh, it's awful. It's horrible. It's especially so hard. when you're stubborn <laughs> You're stubborn and kind of competitive no, and I'm I, a control freak. Like I feel I, like I'm like, yeah. I can fix it if I work hard enough. I mean, I do fitness stuff for a living and I'm like, no, don't be lazy, man. Get up. You can do it. Right. Fix it. Work harder. But when we did and, and when we finally wholeheartedly said, you know, it's okay. It's okay. It's going to be all right. We're just going to roll with this and see where it goes. That's when everything got easier. That's when things started to really unfold. And I could so much more clearly, and I could even see the beauty in the quirkiness. I could find things so much more humorous, you know, and little things that before I would feel like I had to correct or reteach, we could either work around them. And we started, and every family has their own way of dealing with it. And every family should have their own way of dealing. And I'm not saying that our way is the right way, but we've always we've never shied away from the fact that he's autistic. You know, we have always owned it. We've always let people know because in my mind, I felt like if people know, they're more likely to give him a little grace if he doesn't understand, more likely to be a little more compassionate if something takes a moment to process, you know. And so I kind of wanted people to realize, you know, that he does have something going on and he may need a little extra help with things, especially obviously when he was younger. But, you know, and we would just, we would call him out on stuff you know, little quirky habits that he has and stuff, we would call attention to it and laugh with him about it. And he's still to this day. That's why I don't get real riled up with things that people say, because we we're laughing too. <laughs> I mean, we're laughing with him, you know, and he'll make jokes about it. Like sometimes he'll start to do something. Even now he's 25. Like he'll start to do the things he used to do with his hands. And I'll see him, he'll push his hand down in his lap in the car. And then he'll look at me and laugh. <laughs> and I'll be like, you really want to sim right now, don't you? And he's like, I do. <laughs> oh my gosh. What a cutie. And I'm like, go ahead, dude, do it. You know, do whatever you need to do to feel comfortable, you know? So it's so funny how he is now self-aware. Like he, he knows. And he can, he can control those things now where before, you know, he couldn't as much. So it's, it's really cool to watch that self-awareness, you know, develop. And it takes a long time, you know, another, that same psychologist that I had that conversation with that day. And I hope other moms will hear this. If they're at the beginning point, he said to me when he was trying to comfort my hyster hysterically sobbing self, he said, Miss Smith, he said, I want you to remember something. He said, yes, Tanner is very developmentally delayed. He, he is far behind his peers on a lot of levels. He said, but that doesn't mean that he won't develop. He said, it just means he's delayed. He said, it's like your flight's delayed. He said, your flight's coming. He said, it's just, it's, you're just going to have to wait in the airport a little bit longer than everybody else. He said, so just hold on. Your flight's coming. He'll get there. He just might be doing 15-year-old things when he's 21. You know, he might have been doing 11-year-old things when he was 16. And that was so true. Yeah, that happened. But you gotta you you gotta live those twenty years to see it happen. <laughs> I saw your Instagram post that was so sweet and so candid once again, where you were you took Tanner to Eudora Farms. It's like to see the yes. animals, and you wrote, you know, I woke up today a little frustrated, a little irritated that I had to take my adult son to see the animals. But then the minute we got there, I realized that he had this presence and this childlike wonder and this appreciation for life that you maybe needed in your day. I did. It was the best day. 
we had the most fun. We laughed until we had headaches. I mean, because I mean, Eudora Farms is hilarious. It's one of those where you drive through and the animals can eat out of your hand in the car. And I thought to myself, I like the lessons this child or this young man has taught me about myself, my own shortcomings, and you know how I'm so consumed with my to-do list and what I need to accomplish. He really wants to get that high five. He is so excited about going out to eat. Like he means it. Even if it's a restaurant he's been to 20 million times, he's thrilled if you ask him to go. And, you know, I told somebody recently, they were like, well, how is Tanner handling all this? How does he, is he, is he enjoying it? Is it changing him? And I said, the perfect way to describe to people how Tanner's handling all this attention, because this is really who he is. He thinks it's cool. He loves to read the comments. He's so like, you know, touch. He's like, he'll say, that's so nice. He'll go, oh, that's so nice when he reads these comments and stuff. And he loves to make a response video. But then my nephew can call and say, hey, buddy, you want to go get some donuts? He is equally excited about donuts with his cousin as he is about almost 400,000 followers on Instagram. Like to him, <laughs> those two things are the same. Like yeah. those two things are just as important. And I think that's so beautiful. He's thrilled he's making people happy. He's thrilled people hear about Clemson life. He's glad yeah. that people realize he can work, you know, Aww. but. I, I resonate so much with just your personality of like wanting to fix, wanting to achieve, wanting to do. Like one of the biggest things you're helping me learn right now, Nikki, is honestly the switch of like, Instead of, why am I having to deal with this? Why is this happening to me when mm -hmm. I have my shit together? Or I did everything I was supposed to do. Yeah. Why do I have to deal with this? Um, and instead, viewing that as like the opportunity for me to grow as a person, for me to overcome yeah. something that's hard. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful. And I think that applies to so many things in yes. life. You know? I agree. Yeah, it can be it, it, whatever it is, whatever hard thing you're facing. You know, and for us... It was a child diagnosed with autism, but you know, if you just flip that script, you know, and like, instead of why, what am I supposed to be learning? And it's so hard. It's so hard when you're in the thick of the emotions. It really is. But boy, what a difference it makes in your, in your inner well-being. It really yeah. is amazing. One of my favorite quotes on acceptance that I think about like probably every other day is from this book called A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. But he says, uh -huh. basically, you can choose to add suffering to your life by resisting mm -hmm. the present moment, or you can accept the present moment because it already is what it already is. And Ooh, so I a lot that. of that is yeah, so good. A lot that of times so when I think of like, oh no, I wish I'm like, here, we're here, and this is the situation. Yeah. So I can live in alignment and I can swim with the current, or I can keep trying to swim upstream and just yep. make this harder for myself as well. Oh uh, yeah. And it's so true. I mean, I think we cause ourselves so much so much more trouble, you know, than, than we really need to have in our life by fighting things that are really put into our lives to make us grow and that can be beautiful. It's a tall order. <laughs> As someone who is newly married, I've been with Max for about eight uh -huh. years. Well, your thoughts on like, you know, how you've maintained your marriage throughout all the ups and downs. Absolutely. I mean, both Mark, if, if he was sitting here, he would, we would both say <laughs> perseverance and sticking by with do, doing what you said you would do. Because marriage, marriage is a marathon, not a sprint. And it is all about sticking to your word. I mean, it really is. And nothing has taught us more, that more than a special needs child. Because you're both facing something together that you love so much that you would literally die for it. But it's not going the way you want it to go. And neither one of you can fix it. Neither one of you knows what to do. But you, you can either choose to let it break you and push you apart or you can choose to say, okay, we're a team. You're better at this part of it. I'm better at this part of it. You do your job. I'll do mine. No questions asked. We're both working hard. Let's do it. And we really, we really had to do that for a lot of years. We just had to hang on. It's hard to stay connected. When they were little though, we made such a point. We made, and we spent so much money on babysitters because we knew we have to make time for each other. You know, we did a lot of date nights. Right. We, I mean, we went off for weekends. We had, we found good babysitters that we trusted that we knew could keep our children and really perseverance and just saying, look at all these cool humans we created, you mm -hmm. know, and look, and look at them out there thriving. Isn't that cool to say we did that? I mean, it's, I mean, motherhood is definitely the accomplishment of my life. I mean, that's what I've devoted really everything to. I'm formerly a nurse, but being a mom has always been number one. And when I look at the four of them now and I'm like, oh, wow, they are really cool, nice people. 
you know, what more could you want? <laughs> oh, that's so special. Nikki, yeah, thank you so is. much. I'm so excited to get the chance to meet Tanner and say hi to him I right know. now. Hi, Tanner. Hi, Mitch. Hi, Victoria. I'm at Meet You, Victoria. It's nice hey, to buddy. meet you too. Yeah. Tanner, I loved getting to know your mom. We just had such a great conversation. She's the best. I know. My mom is the best. My mom is the best. I'm so glad <laughs> that I get to meet you too. Thank you for I'm taking the time. Do you mind if I ask you? I only have, I have one question for you, but I think it's a good one. Yeah, I don't mind. You can ask me a question. Okay, great. Well, I loved watching you on Love on the Spectrum on Netflix. You are so awesome. Thank and you. I especially <laughs> was really inspired when you shared your purpose. And you said, my purpose is to spread joy all around the world. And something I love to talk about on this show, Real Pod, is purpose and is meaning. So I wanted to know, how did you come up with your purpose and realize that your purpose was to spread joy? Because, because it's good to spread joy. Because it, it, it's good to spread joy. And it makes it people happy. And, 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 it make, and, it make, and it makes them feel good. And how do you recommend someone finds their purpose? Like, how would I find my purpose in life? I'm sorry, but what, what, what do you mean by that? So <laughs> you're so natural at spreading joy. How do you suggest a friend or someone you know finds what they're really good at? When, when they're around nice people, like when, when they're around nice people and, and when they find it, like when a boyfriend finds a girlfriend, a, a girl who girls who they love, uh-huh. And when girls uh -huh. like to find boyfriends and boys that they really love and they want to marry. Oh, I love that. I, well, I found I have my husband, so maybe my purpose is done. I found Max yeah, yeah. and we're happily in love. <laughs> Do you think people should take chances and try new things? Yes, yes, mom. Yes, mom. I think people should take chances and try new things. I think that's what she means. What What have you been doing a lot of late lately? Getting out of your way. Getting out of my comfort zone. Yeah, tell her that's one way to find your purpose and what that's you're supposed to, to do, right? Is to get out of your comfort zone. Yes, right. That's oh, I right. love that. Thank you, Tanner. That's you're so welcome. helpful. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. I appreciate it. And congratulations on all of your recent success. I love watching you and your sister on TikTok. And it's so me great too, to too. see all your videos. Me too. Me too. I'm glad you do, Victoria. <laughs> of course. Well, I'm so happy to meet you. I just, I'm that was my quick you. question. You were awesome. Thank I you so awesome. much. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs>